Welcome to Austin. It took you all a while to get here, but you're here. Ah, we have a lot to celebrate. First of all, being together, it's so nice. I mean, it's, it's always good to be with you guys, but it's especially nice this year after the long layoff. We get to talk about ideas for five or six days, the ideas of Ayn Rand. And we're here to celebrate this book. Talk more about that as the week goes on, but great to be with you. You should have received handouts. Uh, it gives you a very broad, out, very broad outline of the talk and many passages, but I'm only going to refer to a few of them as I go through the talk. So I really recommend that you read them all later. Uh, I do think, you know, there are a lot of good passages there from Ayn Rand and Leonard Peikoff, and I think it would just enrich what you can get out of what I have to say by looking at those words calmly later on. But I, so again, I won't refer to all of them, and even those I referred to, I'll just sort of refer to in passing, not to give you enough time to. Uh, to locate them necessarily. Why examine integrity? To get more out of it. To make sure we're milking it to maximal value. So that we can live it more fully and thereby benefit from it more richly. As the virtues go, I think it's relatively neglected. Not given much spotlight because it concerns living by the other virtues, living by your principles, right? So as such, it can seem a shadow virtue, an echo, an afterthought. It doesn't have a distinct domain in the way that justice does, for instance, or productiveness, right? Those each have, those and all of the other virtues have clear territory. Justice, judging other people objectively, treating them accordingly. Productiveness, working to create values. Even the virtue of independence, reliance on, on, on first-handed judgment. But the scope of integrity, by contrast, spans all domains of our activities. Given that its message is essentially act by your principles, it's easy to adopt the attitude. Well, of course, that's obvious, right? We need a special virtue to tell us about that. And it's easy to assume that if I understand the other virtues, there's nothing more to learn here. Well, today's lecture is meant to jostle us from that attitude if we've fallen into it, to shake us from a possible passivity about integrity. The virtue of integrity isn't superfluous, easily omitted from the list without loss. I don't think Rand includes it chiefly for the laggards among us who need a special reminder. Rand's razor wouldn't abide an empty redundancy. Integrity offers something substantial and significant. A couple of other reasons to study integrity. You might have noticed our cultural climate is pretty antagonistic to the virtue of integrity. What I mean, today's political climate incentivizes selling out on principles, short-term deal-making, trading favors so that you can get yours. The mixed economy makes people cheat to get by. And once some cheat, others conclude that in self-defense, they should too, joining in the call for carve-outs from regulations, subsidies for my industry or my state, which just accelerates the exodus from principles until the idea of someone following a principled course becomes a distant memory, something you read about, you know, maybe our ancestors did that in some bygone era, okay? Further, the reigning moral ethos works against integrity. Give, serve, sacrifice, put others above self. You don't need me to tell you, you can't practice irrational moral principles consistently. On a moral code that demands self-harm, you have to cheat unless you truly hate yourself. So people do cheat. And seeing this all around, what do we learn? What is modeled, subtly reinforced? The idea that moral directives are not to be taken seriously, to be practiced, not really. Wise up, right? This is life. Thus, the insignia of the modern sophisticate, flexibility, being pliable. The point is simply, we face stiff headwinds against the practice of integrity in this culture. And yet another reason to study integrity, I think, is its 
resemblance to certain ideas in conventional morality. Even while the practice of altruism works against integrity, as I've just been indicating, altruists continue to claim that integrity is admirable. It's laudable, right? We make movies celebrating it. Oh, it's a wonderful thing. And I think that this poses a certain trap for objectivists. Wherever an objectivist virtue overlaps with something that's conventionally regarded as virtuous, such as honesty, I mean, everybody praises honesty or justice or integrity, right? Where that occurs, it's easy to assume that we and they basically share the same ideas of what those virtues are and why they're good. You know, when Rand counsels selfishness by contrast, or pride or productiveness, because these cut against the usual moral grain, we know we've got to figure out exactly what she's talking about, right? But with the more familiar virtues that everybody applauds, such as integrity, it's natural for us to not probe as thoughtfully and to settle for a relatively superficial level of understanding. Particularly with integrity, I think we're often prone to think of it in intrinsicist ways. The conventional view is pretty much integrity just is good. There's something simply right about it, noble about the person of integrity. The objectivist view is, no, there isn't. So for explanation, stay tuned. A little bit by way of preliminary, our agenda. So I've given you a broad outline. What follows? This lecture is not a complete presentation of the virtue of integrity, and it's not meant as an introduction to the virtue of integrity. You really want to look at Ayn Rand, you want to look at those eight pages in OPAR, in the chapter on the virtues, he's got about eight, seven or eight pages just on integrity. That, that will give you a much more basic, good, solid grounding in all of the essentials of the objectivist understanding of uh, integrity. You could also look at my chapter on it. What I'm going to give you this afternoon is deliberately slanted. It's slanted to emphasize two or three different aspects that I've since come to think are really important and further enrich my understanding of the virtue, okay? But if you're a relative newcomer to studying the objectivist virtues or something, you should not take this as representative of this is the, the entire way to understand that virtue, okay? So basically, as the outline indicates, I'm going to proceed in three stages, talking first about what integrity is and instructs. That one's pretty brief. Then the value of integrity, why it's a virtue, what we get from it. And then living with integrity, trying to fill out a richer picture of what that involves so that we can practice it more, vigor more vigorously and reap from it more richly. But overall, I hope that you'll see that, as the lecture's title suggests, integrity is the means to being your best self, and thereby having the best life possible. Okay. So let's begin with what integrity is, what it instructs. And because this is fairly simple, we can be brief. I'm going to read you a few passages which are on your handout under the B section. Um, Ayn Rand characterizes integrity as, quote, loyalty to one's convictions and values. It is the policy of acting in accordance with one's values, of expressing, upholding, and translating them into practical reality, close quote. In OPAR, Dr. Peikoff writes that integrity is the virtue of acting as an absolute on rational principle. It is the principle of being principled, quote, uh, as, as your own uh, remarked this morning. Further, Dr. Peikoff writes, it's the policy of practicing what one preaches regardless of emotional or social pressure. So let's fasten for a moment on the kind of thing that integrity is classified as, its genus. A policy, a principle, that was in the characterizations from both Rand and Peikoff, right? A policy, a principle, that means you plan to act on it on a regular basis. It's not a one-off. It's not occasional, sporadically employed. It's not a sometimes thing, the use of which you'll debate on a case-by-case -case basis. Insofar as integrity is a principle, you may get your policy, steady, your steady abiding manner of acting, 
in all appropriate circumstances. Another feature I want to highlight, as Rand specifies, and this also is on the handout under B, I think it's the fifth of the passages, she writes, integrity does not consist of loyalty to one's subjective whims, but of loyalty to rational principles. Peikoff also emphasizes that integrity requires loyalty to rational principles, as opposed to, to any old beliefs that you happen to acquire. If you practice what you preach, but what you preach, what you believe, is itself misguided, you're not helping yourself. That sort of integrity doesn't steer you to a rational course and won't help you achieve genuine values. Thus, integrity involves working to get your ideas right. Now, I'll expand on that somewhat later in, the, in part four of the lecture. But for now, it might be helpful to distinguish what you might call ideas integrity and action integrity. By ideas integrity, I mean simply what concerns the internal consistency of a person's beliefs and values and the truth of his beliefs and values, okay? Action integrity concerns the correspondence of his beliefs and values with his existential actions, the relationship of the inner to the outer, harmony of his convictions with his conduct. Now, ultimately, integrity involves both, for sure. These are unified, okay? But just for purposes of filling out everything you really want to understand to be fully getting the benefit of integrity, I think it's important to understand both of those ideas and action variants. Okay, but part three already, and again, these next two are much longer. We come now to the shank of the lecture. Why is integrity a virtue? What's in it for me? Well, just as many of you will remember from reading the essay, The Objectivist Ethics, Rand stresses the need for moral theory to begin with the question, why be moral? I mean, her way of putting it was to ask, essentially, what are values and do we need them? Why do we need them if we do, right? She starts with that kind of question. Well, similarly, I think we need to ask of every purported virtue, integrity, productiveness, whatever it might be, we need to ask a kind of micro version of that question. Why be honest? Why be just? Why be integrated? Well, in Galt's speech, she tells us, uh, and this is under B on the handout. You might want to look at this. It is, uh, somebody referred to it this morning. I forget if it was now your own. I think it was your own. Um, so B, the first passage, she writes in Galt's speech, integrity is the recognition of the fact that you cannot fake your consciousness just as honesty is the recognition of the fact that you cannot fake existence, that man is an indivisible entity, an integrated unit of two attributes, of matter and consciousness, and that he may permit no breach between dot, 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 action and thought, between his life and his convictions. Why not? Why no breach? I've got a two-part answer. Because reason is man's means of survival. Simple fact about the conditions of human life. For a given individual, however, his rational faculty only serves as his means of survival if he uses it to play that role. So more fully, this is still the first part of the answer, he should permit no breach between his action and his, between his thought and his action, because reason is man's means of survival and principles reflect man's means of reasoning, the kind of reasoning that he needs to do to get the job done. The job here is living, being happy. Reason's value lies in its guiding us to create values and flourish. It can only play that role, however, if we use it that way, if we identify the appropriate principles and then we actually follow them, which is what integrity is talking about, right? So let's go back to some basics here. We can't get by on, with merely case-by-case -case direction of our attention. Unlike the lower animals, human beings cannot survive by taking each hour as it comes as a self-contained atom of experience unto itself, unrelated to others. Such attention isolationism, what now? What now? And now? That isn't enough for us. 
Human life demands bigger picture thinking, a wider angle lens. We need thinking elevated beyond the here and now, sufficiently elevated, sufficiently abstract to get us to tomorrow and well beyond. But the get us to tomorrow is sort of a shorthand, right? Human life requires long range thought and planning, conceptual identification of principles. Principles, as you've heard many other objectivists, uh, objectivist intellectuals say, principles are ways of seeing, of understanding. They're cognitive. Valid principles put you in the know. Notice something. Cows don't need integrity. Parrots don't need to think in principles. We do. The virtue of integrity is derivative from our need for principle. Again, to identify rational principles and then our need to act on these principles. So integrity instructs, live by your conclusions. Reason that's strictly in the lab or confined to the seminar room, that doesn't accomplish anything. It's reason that you act on that delivers the benefits of reason. Okay? As Peikoff observes, quote, thought is not an end in itself, but a means to action. If life is the standard, man must think in order to gain knowledge, then use his knowledge to guide him in creating the material values his life requires. In other words, I have to understand what is so and to act like it. Integrity is valuable because thought is for action, because ideas are for living, and integrity is how you live the recognition that reason is man's means of survival. Actions are the way we take our ideas seriously. Second part of my answer. In starting this segment, uh, I asked, what's in this segment, whatever number it is, number two, what are we in, number three? Uh, I asked, yeah, the value of integrity. What's in it for me? And that is the proper attitude. The main thing to understand about why integrity is a virtue is its selfishness. Integrity takes seriously that reason is my means of happiness, my key to having the best life possible. Correspondingly, your attitude toward integrity should be, my happiness depends on this. Your mind is your meal ticket. The only reason to practice integrity is to make your life as good as it can be to act in ways that respect reality and thus give you the greatest chance of success in achieving your values. It's in your interest. Integrity has nothing on you. It makes no claim of you that isn't good for you, that it isn't in your interest to respect through your actions. Flip side, cheating always costs you. The person tempted to violate his principles thinks the doing so will get him ahead in some way, right? Will make him better off. It won't. If his principles are rational, nothing good can come of defying them, of pretending that a general truth is not true. When, and I know many of you are familiar with this uh, story, when Rand was praised for her courage in fighting the establishment, she replied, I am not brave enough to be a coward. I see the consequences too clearly, which is another way of saying, I'm not stupid. Right? I like myself. I like my life. I want the best one I can have. Uh, rumor has it she was rather a selfish woman. God bless her. God bless her. God bless her. Uh, at any rate, so again, you know, I'm not brave enough to be a coward. I see the consequences too clearly. In other words... My courage, what you're calling my courage, is my self-interest, my seeing vividly the effects of my course if I give in, if I don't stick with my principles, my best judgment. Peikoff has a beautiful discussion of this. It's very brief, but in his section on integrity, he discusses how what we often call strong willpower in the face of temptation on someone's part actually reflect, reflects strength of understanding, clarity, and strength of wanting what is best for me. It's selfishness. Breaches of integrity are self-sabotaging. Consider for a moment how the person without integrity, 
hurts himself. While integrity reflects understanding our need to live by principles, the violator pretends that shortcuts are available, alternative routes. He tells himself, I don't need to heed this fact or that one. I've got a better way. What this person is doing, as Dr. Peikoff writes, is dispensing with cognition, suspending his conceptual faculty as if he doesn't need it. He can simply set it aside with no cost. He's acting like an animal who doesn't need the bother of principles, that higher level of understanding. Suppose it's the principle of honesty that he's violating. That principle tells him faking things doesn't change things. Yet, in violating it, he's acting as if faking things does change things sometimes. That's why he's ignoring the principle here. This will not end well. But further, even if you leave aside the content of a person's principles, so his principles could be altruistic, egoistic, socialist, religious, whatever, right? Just focus for a moment on the fact that he doesn't live up to what he thinks is true and right. The problem with such a person, such a case, isn't simply that he'll undermine some specific end on a given occasion. Oh, I'm not going to get that job. I'm going to be found out, or I'm not going to get anywhere with that woman, right? Failures of integrity, they don't just sabotage individual projects or aims, they're more deeply self-undermining. They weaken your character, your ongoing abilities. Doing something that violates your principles is destructive to you and to the kind of life that you supposedly seek. Now, there's a lot more that we could say on that, but I'm not going to, but it's, a, it's a, an important aspect of all of the objectivist virtues. But more immediately, I'll say this. When a person defy, defies his own professed convictions, what signals is he sending himself? Basically, basically, I think one of three things. I'm full of hot air. I don't really believe the things I claim to. Or, these ideas aren't true. These principles aren't sound. They don't make sense. Or, ideas don't matter. Even if they're true, principles aren't important for practical living. The effects of this? It plants self-doubt, or ideas doubt, or both. When you violate what you regard as good principles, you're giving yourself reason to think less of yourself and less of ideas. Neither is conducive to flourishing. Now, as I noted back in the introduction, conventional morality also teaches that integrity is noble. Yet its image is of the person with integrity as the dutiful martyr. Right? The person with integrity makes the tough sacrifice. He puts the right thing above the convenient thing, the self-serving. Rand understands that living by your principles is self-serving rather than self-denying when your principles are rational. It is noble to live by your ideas because it means living by your mind. And even there, let's be a little bit more careful, right? Because it's your means of living, of enjoying all these Saturdays and Tuesday nights and Thursdays and whatever it might be, right? Living by your principles is what principles are for, living. So it's important to understand that integrity isn't about being a good person, keeping a clean record, you know, spotless, staying out of trouble, staying out of the principal's office. Integrity is about life improvement, upgrading your experience to the greatest heights possible. Integrity helps you have the life that you want. A person of integrity is a good person, but that's because he's acting on the principles that enable him to flourish. Living by rational principles is the way to be smartly selfish. It represents sophisticated selfishness. So in any particular episode where you feel some pull against maintaining your principles, you shouldn't think of the issue as, oh, it's me on the line here, my standing, will I you know, adhere to my integrity? The perspective should be, by which of these alternatives will I really help myself? the most. Right? Moral principles are your means of thriving, not of scoring a good grade in somebody else's grade book. 
Excuse me a sec. <coughs> a further note on conventional views as opposed to a proper understanding of integrity. Altruism. Altruism sterilizes integrity. It converts it into a pointless duty, at best, truly into a tool of self-abnegation. To preach self-sacrifice as the substance of morality, while also professing that integrity is a major moral demand among the most admirable, right? that plants a disconnect between theory and practice, between moral ideals and living, actual living. There's the breach that Galt advises against in that passage I read earlier, right? It's in the very theory of altruism. Altruism bakes in the notion that, of course, you have to violate principles. That's how you get, al uh, get along. That's how you manage, right? And in practical code, altruism requires betrayal of that code. It makes cheating pay. Thus, altruism quietly, surreptitiously gives integrity a bad name. Actually, it gives people a bad name because it makes it impossible for people to, to consistently practice what they believe. Altruism extols integrity. Oh, it's a noble goal. But it condemns damned people as just not good enough, so inherently depraved, right? In Kant's words, such crooked timber, the crooked timber of humanity is one of his lovely phrases. Notice, for Rand, integrity is good for you. It nourishes for altruism, integrity will kill you. So let me underscore what may already be plain, I hope. I've been trying to emphasize it. Integrity is selfish. Contrary to popular imagery, the person of integrity is not good at denying himself, bracing himself, taking his medicine. Integrity doesn't ask you to give something up. It isn't the objectivist version of Lent. It's not a penance, a price you got to pay. It's the cashing in on your mind and rational principles as your means of happiness. I mean, remember something else that Galt said. The purpose of morality is to teach you to enjoy yourself and live. Moral principles enable you to flourish. When you violate any of your principles, when you violate integrity, you're sabotaging yourself. Okay, part four, living with integrity. How to practice it more vigorously. Now again, I'm not going to be comprehensive here, but I want to focus on two important aspects. First, while integrity is primarily about acting on your principles, here I want to spy spotlight the thinking that should take place behind the action. Integrity requires considerable thought, considerable introspection about yourself, and reflection about your principles. So I'll discuss both of those, but those are both the first part of, of what I'm going to talk about here. That is the thinking that's got to be involved in having the virtue of integrity. And then second, I want to emphasize that integrity is not a passive virtue or something on hold most of the time. It's not like a fireman who does a lot of waiting around for an emergency to erupt. Properly, it should be an ongoing concern that demands active initiative. And I think that appreciating both of these aspects of what integrity demands can invigorate our exercise of it. So first on the thinking required. Integrity demands, and, and first on the first part of the thinking that's required, integrity demands ongoing, honest introspection, which Rand characterized, and I have a few passages on introspection on the handout, which Rand characterized as a process of cognition directed inward. It's about your motives, courses of action, goals, emotions, patterns of behavior. A person does not exhibit integrity if he simply happens to not contradict himself or betray his convictions. Integrity must be conscious, deliberate. Now, it's not that a person must be thinking about his integrity all the time, continually asking, how would this option affect my integrity? How would this affect my character? Rather, 
The idea is he must be aggressively using his principles to guide his course. Integrity per se under that name can be in the background of his mind, but his principles should be in the foreground. Consider, part of what it means to have a moral conviction is that you care about acting on it. But if you truly care, you check to make sure that your actions are on point, that they stick to the program. So the purpose of introspection isn't to grade yourself on past performance. It's primarily to instruct, to assist you in making the best, the most sound choices. To do that, though, the more you know about yourself and all the crucial elements of your thinking and choices, about the beliefs that are pivotal in certain circumstances, about the emotions that might be inclining you a little bit too much in this direction or in that direction, right, that are potentially at odds with some of your considered beliefs, the greater your understanding of these sorts of things, the better. The better position you'll be in to make smart decisions that are flourishing forward. For instance, if I realize that I'm prone to excessive caution or to being easily intimidated by particular people or to be unduly, unrealistically ambitious in setting goals for myself, well, then I can check for those kinds of things creeping into my thinking in a particular situation, right? Or if on a, given situ uh, on a given occasion I find my emotions unusually intense or seemingly disproportionate to what's at stake here, right? You know, why am I so angry at my boyfriend? Or why am I so anxious about that presentation that I have to make at the office in the morning? Well, by introspecting, you might realize some of what's actually operating. For instance, if the source of the problem isn't something your boyfriend did, but it's actually some long-standing insecurity on your part or something like that, right? The more you understand yourself, the better you can assess what you should do in this situation, how you should respond, and so on. Okay. I mean, there's a lot more that can be said about the value of introspection for so much of our lives, but I just think it is important to being able to practice integrity fully. And just a few cautions about uh, introspection here. You want to be on the lookout for rationalizations, for half-truths, and for evasion. Just a word on each of these. Rationalization, basically a rigged explanation to reach a conclusion that you've already adopted. You know, but you rig an explanation to justify a breach of integrity. And in this vein, you know, we need to be careful of the stories we tell ourselves sometimes, or the little catchphrases that we use to excuse failures to abide by our principles. Those little th phrases like, well, nothing's perfect, or it won't make a difference, you know, if I do go ahead and apply for the job or apply for the grant, I'll never get it anyway, it won't make a difference. Um, or he won't know the difference, you know, if I fudge a little bit the number of hours that I put in this week or something like that, right? So you just want to be sure that you're being honest with yourself. Similarly, beware of half-truths. Half-truth is half true, right? It would save me a lot of trouble if I didn't do blah, 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 right? That's why they're seductive. They are half true. But if you don't grasp the whole truth that's available on some issue, then they don't, you know, the half-truths don't provide the full knowledge that you need. We've all heard of cognitive dis dissonance, right? Well, I want to suggest there's also something like a cognitive incomplete. As many of you know, in college, you can get an incomplete for a course if you, you know, you did a lot of the work, but not all of it, and there's more work to be done to pass the course. You get an incomplete in the meantime, okay? Well, here with introspection, my message is don't settle for, well, you know, I did some introspecting. I did a little bit of reflecting, and I found a certain thing. Next case, you know, job done, right? No, you want to dig deeper. If you're getting any hints that there's more that might be worth probing there, you have to complete the work, okay? Don't just settle for a half-truth. And then also a word about being on the lookout for evasion. Evasion is a failure of integrity. You're often tempted to evade when you're conflicted about a serious issue, you know, which is understandable. A lot of issues are complicated, and it's very natural to be conflicted initially 
about what to properly to think about an issue, right? And that's when we, we often want to evade, or when you want incompatible things, or you want to avoid an unpleasant decision. I mean, unpleasant decisions are very unpleasant, right? I mean, this is no fun, right? Example, my good friends Bill and Kate have had a serious falling out over a serious issue. And man, if what either side is saying about the other is true, yeah, that would be pretty damn bad. And I would condemn that person too. But I really like Bill. And I really like Kate. And I really like my friendships with both of them. And I don't want to have to choose. So I keep not facing the issue. This is a drift from integrity, right? Now you're not, you know, you're not directly plunging the dagger into your integrity. You're not saying, I believe principle X, to hell with principle X. No, it's not that open, right? But you're failing to act with integrity. To evade is to not integrate. It's disintegration. When you refuse to consider something, you're saying, that, that item of information I can do without. I don't need it. It won't do me any good. You're fragmenting your awareness of the world and embargoing certain parts of it. I don't want to know that. I don't want to have to think about that. Notice the, I don't want to. I don't want to, right? Feelings here, emotions, emotionalism. That cripples your ability to put together what you do know and prevents fuller knowledge that you do need. You're implying, I can navigate successfully without this piece of the puzzle. You intend to make things easier for yourself, but in fact, evading makes your path harder because you're blinding yourself in one eye. The shortcut with its premise, I, I need only some information, partial is plenty, is a lie. Reason is man's means of survival. Reason as a source to knowledge, awareness as full as possible. If, even if it's you know, what you become aware of in regard to one of the friends is very disappointing. Right? Okay, I'm going to skip a little bit. An important principle of the objectivist ethics, again, familiar to many of you, is that errors of knowledge are not breaches of morality. And I have that on the handout if you want to look at it later, the fuller passage. Errors of knowledge are not breaches of morality. But that shouldn't be used as a free pass by which a person claims ignorance to excuse things that he should have known or misgivings that he should have attended. Right? Knowledge isn't a gift from the gods randomly awarded to a lucky few. You're not the helpless recipient of errors of knowledge like genes I got from my mother's side of the family, right? While some errors may not be your fault, many are, or some are. I have some on, it, on the page, so I'll say some. That sounds nice, all right? But I mean, some are, right? You're responsible for what you know and don't know. I mean, there's a little qualification on that, but basically, you're 18, inform yourself, right? An innocent error of knowledge isn't a breach of morality, but complacency is. Passivity toward your beliefs, when you have reason to suspect mistakes or omissions or incompatibilities, that is a breach of morality. I stressed a moment ago when I said, you know, you're responsible for what you know. It's a responsibility, again, to yourself, to your interest, to take charge and manage your thinking and correct mistakes and be ever expanding your knowledge. If you're, ha you know, if you're after your happiness, you can't be a potted plant. Oh, well, I didn't know better. Hey, it's your business to know better because that's the path to living better, to making better choices, if that's what you really want. So, to reiterate, introspect. Not just when you're stuck at a red light. You know, there's nothing else to do, so what the hell? I'll do a little, eh, what's, what am I thinking about these? No, you know. We don't always know our own minds, but it's foolish not to. For an objectivist to skimp on introspection is like saying, reason is man's means of survival. You know, never mind. Never mind my mind. Integrity demands taking ownership for your consciousness so that you can use it most effectively. Okay, I have to, you know, you have to give you guys a breath periodically, so you get a breath. I keep talking. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, let's see. Okay. So I'm still elaborating on the thought that I think is really important for the virtue of integrity. 
But now I want to address the second kind of thought. I've been talking about you need to introspect. You also need to reflect on your principles themselves. The core of integrity, again, yes, that demands living by your principles. But integrity isn't simply about the match of intellectual convictions with material action, right? That action aspect of integrity that I mentioned at, toward the very beginning. Integrity also demands subjecting your principles to searching examination to make sure that your beliefs are correct, that they furnish valid foundations for, our, for the actions that they inform. I mean, recall Rand's claim, and this was one that I quoted earlier in, in the talk. Recall her claim that integrity does not consist of loyalty to one's subjective whims, but of loyalty to rational principles. This means you need to think about your theory as well as your practice. Now, some of this overlaps somewhat with the concerns of the virtue of pride, the virtue that concerns the formation of character, moral ambitiousness, moral perfection, issues that Ben Baer was talking about this morning in a lecture that he presented. And on the handout, you can look at them later, I've given you two passages on the essence of pride in Ayn Rand's view. But here what I want to emphasize is that integrity is not detached from the content of principles. In fact, it's when you're on misguided premises, misguided principles, that integrity is especially hard. When your principles themselves are streaked with errors, you will have more grounds, at least implicitly, for not acting on them. But my point here isn't check your pr principles so that you can maintain integrity as if that's an end in itself. The point is, errors cost you. The fact that you're not doing wrong knowingly doesn't mean that you're not doing wrong. And in objectivism, again, what wrong means is self-harmful. That's what practicing a misguided principle is. It's harming yourself. Think about some of the heroes in Atlas, and the same applies uh, uh, to Dominique, for instance, in Fountainhead. But think, think just for a moment about a couple of the heroes in Atlas. They suffer as a result of their errors. The fact that Hank and Dagny do not intend to be helping their enemies and hurting themselves doesn't mean that they aren't. The effects of their actions are the same, whether or not they're conscious on their part. Hank, by retaining an erroneous notion of justice and obligation toward Lillian, is hurting himself. Not for nothing does Francisco repeatedly advise them to check their premises. Objectivism isn't an ethics of intention. Goodness doesn't revolve around meaning well or effort. That's primacy of consciousness. It's an ethics for living, not hoping, not even trying. I mean, trying is good. There's a lot we can say about trying, right? But you don't need to try to understand reality. You need to understand reality, right? Having your heart in the right place, that doesn't get the trains to run. Just ask Dagny, okay? So there are two complementary dimensions of practicing integrity. Follow your principles and make sure that your principles are valid, that your end and that you're applying them appropriately. Living by the mind will do you little good if your mind is full of junk. Now again, junk, that's a strong way of putting it, but fidelity to invalid ideas does you no good. It actually does you bad. It works against you. It does not help you to flourish. It helps you to fail. Now, to the second practical requirement of integrity. I said, so this is beyond the thought material, um, I said it should be an ongoing concern that demands active initiative. Common image of the person of integrity, again, he resists temptation. However juicy the prize that's dangled, he is firm, steadfast. He won't compromise a principle. But most of a person's life doesn't involve integrity, right? We make movies about these great conflicts that occasionally erupt a man for all seasons, if you're old enough to remember that movie about Thomas More and Henry VIII, right? Or um, uh, 
uh, Oscar Wilde's play, An Ideal Husband, about potential corrupt, corruption of a politician. But I mean, most people's ideas, well, integrity, it arises occasionally, but most weeks of most of our lives don't offer these momentous conflicts and occasion, uh, integrity just isn't an issue. That's misleading, I think. Integrity is not simply forbearance from sin or from great temptation. Integrity is not quiescent, merely on call to put out the occasional fire. Properly, its, more, its use is more continuous and proactive. Now again, let me break this down a little bit. Integrity demands that you embrace your principles as principles that function as your compass in daily decisions. As I said earlier, to affirm a principle isn't just a one-time check mark, you know, a thumbs up, a passing nod. A moral principle represents a commitment, ongoing and global, across all areas of your life. Virtues are principles for leading your life. They're living principles. All of the objectivist virtues are conclusions about how to live selfishly to promote your happiness. On principles for a moment, and again, I have a few passages that are relevant on the handout. A principle is a generalization, general and that it is true, of numerous individual situations. Peikoff writes that a principle is a general truth on which other truths depend. It identifies something non-obvious that many situations have in common, and it is fundamental in that it underlines other truths. Now, in thinking about principles, we often tend to emphasize their general nature. But here I want to stress that their you know, valid principles are true. And that means that when you act in defiance of a valid principle, you're acting in defiance of fact, of the way things are. I can treat dishonesty, for instance, as a path to the good life, but faking things doesn't change them. I can defy justice in dealing with other people and make my policy I don't judge, but that doesn't change the character of the individuals I encounter or their effects on me. I'm going to come back to that example of justice in a moment. But the point is, if a principle is valid, it's a keeper, right? You want to keep it at your side as your all-the-time guide. The only point in adopting principles is to steer one's conduct by them, to act under their tutelage. So the person of integrity uses his principles as constant guideposts, ideas he checks in with as he goes, as he goes about his decisions. He's an active scout, alert to apply his principles. If your principles are sound, the more you apply them, and apply them properly, the better off you'll be. Let's come back to justice for a moment. An example of a misapplication of this virtue. I referred to the mistake of refusing to judge people. I mean, you might make that your, your principle, okay? But, um, you know, so one kind of mistake is to refuse to judge people. An equally important mistake is judging without a sufficient basis. And once in a while, I get the impression that this is sometimes a form of objectivist virtue seeking, uh, virtue signaling. That is, you know, I want everybody to know what a good objectivist I am, so I make judgments. I don't abdicate, right? There, eh, you might have seen some of that sometimes. I have, sadly. I think I have. I think it's a misapplication of, uh, of the virtue. Judgment is not a virtue. Not according to objectivism. Justice is. But justice demands judging objectively and treating individuals as they deserve. Judging objectively, judging when you've gathered all the appropriate information and have done the necessary sifting and premise checking and thinking through, when you've done the work of being objective. When I don't do that, but I judge a person, be it negatively or positively, I'm not fair to him. I'm embezzling or I'm counterfeiting, to use language that Rand used elsewhere, right? I'm not fair to him, and I'm rooking myself, blinding myself to the truth about a person. Now, I use this example also to illustrate how it's easy to lapse into faulty assumptions about what our principles instruct. You might have a perfectly valid principle, but have some 
confusions about the proper way to apply that principle. So again, here, just with this example, justice does not equal judging. Those are not one and the same thing. And integrity demands that we frequently revisit our principles and our applications of our principles to make sure that they make sense. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I want to say a few words about another aspect of living with integrity, which I think can be confusing. I think some of you, this may not be at all confusing or tempting, but I think sometimes, I think it's helpful to think a little bit about cost-benefit analysis and how it relates to maintaining our principles and maintaining our integrity. Cost-benefit analysis. From a certain perspective, that can seem to be antithetical to respecting a principle. It can seem like, well, that's the perspective of a pragmatist, and we don't want that. We're, we're all about principles, right? So cost-benefit analysis, that should be off limits. But then there's another perspective from which you can think, well, wait a minute, cost-benefit analysis, that sounds so rational. That sounds so systematic. That sounds like exactly the way to go. So I th I th Cost-benefit analysis makes sense sometimes, but I just want to say a little bit about the general conditions under which it does and doesn't so that we have a proper grip on using it in a way that does not involve the compromise of principles and the compromise of integrity, okay? When people first propose to deal with some issue, some decision, by tallying costs and benefits, it sounds sensible. But what often happens, not always, but what often ensues is that then factors are assumed to constitute a cost or a benefit and slotted into those columns on the basis of, well, it's just obvious, isn't it, right? Unhinged from any rational standard. Costs and benefits are treated as self-evidencies. That, I think, is where a lot of cost-benefit analysis goes astray. I mean, remember, there are no intrinsic values. Costs and benefits are not primitives. They're not like wandering nomads that carry their positive or negative charge to wherever they might land. Right? A thing's value is not instilled within it, a permanent and indelible feature that it carries to every context. Ooh, I got a $5 coupon. Ooh, I, I don't like the pizza at that place, but hey, this is $5. This is worth it. Right? I mean, you know that mentality? I sometimes have that mentality. It's like, a, not, but Terry, I hate that pizza or whatever it might be. But that's what often happens, right? Um, now, not always. So cost-benefit analysis is not necessarily at odds with principle and integrity. The critical question for any cost-benefit calculation is, by what yardstick? What is the standard for identifying something as a cost or a benefit? Is it dollars? Is it smiles? Convenience? What's crucial to integrity is that what qualifies as a cost or a benefit must be under the sovereignty of appropriate principles. Costs and benefits can't represent some different standard based on a different set of goals. So where's Tal? Tal, where's Tal? Is he here? Anyway, you know, suppose we started screaming out, Tal, Tal, this guy will write you a check for $5 million if you just play down the atheism in objectivism, or if you just play down that free trade stuff, you know, $5 million, fast, easy, simple, single source. Come on, that'll fund a lot of programs. Where are you, Tal? He's not even listening. Good for him. We know, you know you have a good man at the, at the helm when he's not even listening. You know, you might think, this is a no-brainer, right? This is a no-brainer for the benefit column. No, 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 no. No, we need a little brain here, right? The question is, what good does this benefit do you if what you're programming, all the programs it'll buy, that's not objectivism, right? By what standard would that be a gain? Would it advance ARI's mission to promote Ayn Rand's philosophy? Hmm. Again, the larger point is, cost-benefit analysis can be a betrayal of principle and integrity. It isn't necessarily it's fine to consider costs and benefits as long as their identification as such is governed by appropriate standards. You don't want to let cost-benefit analysis be a runaway train, taking on a life of its own, detached from rational principles. Okay, so to wrap up this segment, 
on living with integrity. The overall aim is to internalize integrity, to normalize it, naturalize it. Peikoff writes in Opar, once one knows the right moral principles, the next step is to build them into one's soul by repeated rational action. One must make these principles second nature. That's the end of that passage. I, so it's me again talking now. Ideally, a person's understanding of the propriety of egoistic principles will be in sync with his feelings, his desires, his inclinations. They'll all be aligned, unified in supporting what is truly best for him, objectively, all things considered. I say this is ideal because life is easier when you're in that state and you're more effective. You'll take appropriate action more readily, more often, and more agreeably with less struggle. What we're after is organic integrity, as opposed to taking your bitter pills integrity, right? Now, obviously, you can't just dictate your desires, simply decide to experience certain inclinations. What you can do, though, is name your principles, the principles that you think are true, and act on that basis. Doing so repeatedly will make it easier, and you'll reap the rewards. Practicing sound principles more consistently will make you happier. All right, so I'm going to conclude. Most people hold a warped conception of morality as consisting of arbitrary duties, things you just have to do. Or, at best, they think, well, adhering to these moral principles, it helps people. Not yourself, but people, you know, somebody, or something, the planet. Right? Essentially, though, moral principles are seen as impediments to hold us back from pursuing our interest, to keep us from lying, cheating, lazing, greed. Integrity or any moral principle works like speed bumps and road barriers to slow you down, to impose hurdles, make it harder to get where you're trying to go, what would be good for you. Ayn Rand recognized, no, morality is not an obstacle course. Moral principles aren't devices to make life harder, but to guide you through, to help you up, to ascend to better and better experience. Leonard Peikoff once observed, and this was an answer to a question, in answer, in response to a question on his podcast, he observed that one of his two major revelations from all his years with Ayn Rand was one that he grasped early on, that the moral is the practical. The moral is the practical. It's in your interest. And that's really what I've been elaborating on this afternoon. Human beings live by integrity. Literally, we survive and we flourish thanks to rational principles that we identify and that we then respect in practice. The objectivist ethics teaches that your happiness depends on your acting on these principles. So for this reason, one of my chief messages today is don't leave integrity in the background as an afterthought to the other virtues. Don't leave it on the bench like a relief pitcher, you know, employed occasionally, but not an everyday starter like honesty or productiveness or independence. The continual active exercise of integrity enables you to be your best self as a thinker and as a doer which again translates into having the best life possible. Greater integrity for greater happiness. That's the idea. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So we have, I think we have just about a half hour for questions, right? So good, if there are questions. And who's going to tell me if there are any online questions? Is there somebody I should focus on? I'll tell you from the back. Okay, somebody back there. Thanks. Hello. Hi. I was wondering if you could help clarify how you could distinguish between exception making for a principle 
and trying to respect the context and meaning of a principle. So, for example, if I were in the situation of lying to a Nazi and trying to hide the Jews during the Holocaust, it wouldn't be a breach of honesty because it doesn't demand exposing information and it, yeah, it doesn't demand that. And, um, and I think this comes up a lot when dealing with difficult situations and trying to respect your principles. Um, so, for an, an I mean, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, good question. I mean, all principles, moral principles, and other, all principles are contextual in that they are meant to inform, they reflect, and they should inform, you know, a certain kind of situation and uh, certain kinds of fact. Uh, the broader the principle, and I mean, the more something truly is at the level of principle, at that level of abstraction, that means what it is guiding is what is the case most of the time, particularly with the moral principles, for instance. It's like, yeah, basically to live, you need to not fake things when it comes to honesty. You need to be productive. That's not just, well, you know, there are these weird situations in which you need to be productive. No, it's the basic nature of man that he needs to produce the stuff that he needs to sustain himself and so on, right? And basically you need to be judging people objectively in order to navigate people and deal with people in fruitful ways and so on. So principles name things that are, let's put it just crudely for now, almost always the case, but not always, right? The proper, well, whether a principle even applies does depend on the context, but that's not exception making to the principle, it's just recognizing when the principle governs and when it does not. But I, I feel like there's more to your question that I'm not really addressing. Um, I guess it, it can get more complicated in more concrete situations. Like, so for example, if you're on a diet um, and you want to stick to it very strictly, but then you make it exceptions perhaps, you know, it's good to take breaks or you have more work to do during the day and right. like, well, um, maybe case, I'm tired. I mean, I think in cases like those, right? What's, <laughs> you heard it here first. You know what's really important in life? Being honest with yourself. It's always really important. It's always, whatever the kind of, it, like to be honest with yourself. And I think we probably all know from personal experience, there are occasions in which you're telling yourself a lot of garbage so that you can have that piece of cake or whatever it might be. And there are situations in which, no, it really does seem to make sense. And you're not, but I mean, there is no formula that one can give to somebody about how to be honest with yourself. It's pay attention to the little doubts, the little misgivings, those little things on the wings of your consciousness that are telling you, I'm not sure about this, right? So, yeah, and it's hard to know. I mean, sometimes it's a little bit hard to know. Am I really being honest with myself here or not? But it's not that a principle or some way of understanding the principle, I think, will tell you what to do. I mean, you can, re why did I adopt this principle in the first place? What, and a diet isn't quite the same thing as a principle, but it's, you know, or, I mean, I think we all recognize the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, but you've just, I mean. I no, but that, that's helpful, thank you. Yeah, I don't know, I don't feel like it's that helpful. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rusty. You see, I take a year off and what the hell? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for today's talk and your many talks on morality. I, I know you. they've had a profound impact oh, on you. my life. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the Rand quote about not being brave enough to be a coward. Yeah. So it sounds like that vision is the key to a selfish integrity there. Uh, it, you know, if you know for certain that I'm going to receive $50 tomorrow from you know, giving you $5 today, it's going to be really e no difficult at all for me to pull out my wallet and, and hand that to you. Yeah, is, yeah, is, and this is, that... is something that Opar really clarified for me. And he, j I mean, I think it's like two or three sentences at most in his section on integrity, but where he just so, you know, he makes visible how it's a matter of vision. It's like you can see if you, but obviously that presupposes you have the right principles and you have them for the right reasons with a deep understanding of this is what's going to be good for me to live by this principle. Therefore, I'm not tempted, you know, again, to use some of the examples from the talk, by the $5 coupon. That's not going to be good for me. I'm not tempted by the, just play down the atheism. And it's like, but if you see, it's like, that's not going to get me what I want. Remember, principles are for purposes. 
principles are not these intrinsicist ends in themselves or duties on the objectivist view. It's all in service to your having the best. So you want to try to understand, you know, and, and only adopt principles when you really get, oh yeah, honesty is the way for me to go. Or like, you know, productiveness, that's the way for any human being to go. Independence, that's crude, right? And I mean, sometimes you don't get all of that right away, and that's fine. You have to be honest with yourself about how, you know, I get it most of the way, but I'm, I'm not sure about these kinds of situations. Or okay, think more, talk more, you know, go on Clubhouse and, and ask a, an objectivist philosopher or something. Yeah. Okay. So, so it sounds like the difficulty is in the long-range view That's of That's where we often have more trouble, yeah. right? And also, let's notice, when we talk about principles and the adoption of principles and re reflection on principles often happens in calm, you know, in peace, or maybe it's in some conversation with other people, but then you're going back and you're rereading and you're thinking and mulling, right? Decisions, uh, you know, whether it be about the diet or the taking the money that's going to get you this or that, or made, you know, usually in somewhat more emotionally charged circumstance, there are usually some emotions that are pulling you, and so you want to be aware of the power of the present to distort, perhaps, by you know, what's doable now or what's, what will satisfy a certain appetite now. So, yeah, part of it is the long range. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So do I'd I like go to back bring there in a, now? An yeah. online question, yeah. Uh, so, Andrew writes, one motive for integrity is to have a joyous pride in one's character. Integrity gives you evidence that that can be experienced. Do you have any comments on positive emotions as motivation for virtues? That's interesting. Um, I mean, you know, well, after a certain level of experience, and it doesn't take all that much, you know you'll feel better about yourself if you do certain things, right? But I don't think that should be the primary motivation, and I think it's sometimes a mistake to it, and I'm not saying that Andrew is, a, is making this mistake, but we, a lot of people do make something like this mistake, I think. Um, how will I feel about myself if I do X? Or will I be able to look at myself in the mirror if I do Y, right? What you really want to understand is would there be a good reason for thinking ill of myself or well of myself if I do X or Y, right? You need to understand, so you don't want to just you certainly don't want to use an emotionalist standard of how will I feel about myself. It is, I think, a fact that um, the more you, and I mean, whenever you do what you think is right, yeah, that's going to give rise to some positive emotions. Um, but I don't think that should be the motivation, right? But you, I mean, there's more to be said here, and you do want to be thinking about the whole picture of, um, you know, all of the kinds of ramifications of your actions. Anyway. Hi. Um, so I find, um, I find it, I find myself uh, confused a lot when I am, um, when I come across uh, a difficult situation and I feel like I am lacking in principles and I think a part of it is because I don't know what principles look like. Like I don't know if I have them or if I'm forming them. Can you give examples of principles? Well, I mean, I think, okay. I know they're contextual, but like just sure. random examples. Well, I mean, these aren't too random, but I mean, the virtues, the, the specific virtues that Rand talks about, honesty, integrity, productiveness, independence, uh, pride, um, forgetting one, justice, did I already say that? Um, J-H-I. Integrity, independence. Anyway, um, I mean, they're, they're principles. They're general truth. Again, just to think back to the basics of what a, a principle is in any realm. A prin well, I won't go into a lot. Uh, a general truth that's f somewhat fundamental in that other derivative truths depend on it. How I should grade this student, you know, the, the virtue of justice. Well, I have to judge objectively and treat accordingly. So, I'm going to apply that principle to, you want to, to be just to the students in your class, you have to grade each of the papers objectively. Give them what they deserve. If they're freshmen, that's going to be a little bit different from if they're juniors or if they're graduate students and so on, right? Honesty, if it's a principle, that tells you, 
So you don't lie here just because it's a shortcut to something else that emotion tells you you want right now, or something like that, okay? Um, but I mean, there are principles of gravity. I mean, there are principles in many realms, right? There are principles of man management. There are principles of good pedagogy. There are principles of nursing. I mean, there are principles, but they're general. I mean, they are abstractions. If they're valid, they're true abstractions that are based on a lot of sound, inductive uh, observation and inference. And they can help you to, I mean, a lot of what they do, right, is they're get, they represent get you to tomorrow thinking, as I put it in the talk, right? They elevate you beyond the here and now and give you guidance for how to proceed in all sorts of situations that are unique, that are distinct from one another, but similar to one another in, th in this respect or that respect. Let's go yeah, with that, that for now. It. Thank you. And whether or not you have principles, I mean, you want to think about how you understand. So for instance, let's say you're relatively early on in learning about objectivism and trying to figure out, do you agree with this, what she's talking about, about free markets here, what she's talking about, about environmentalism here, or the, or the virtues. I mean, you, before you say, uh, yeah, I, I, I get it, and I sign on, like, yeah, that's one of my principles, you do want to, I mean, you don't want to do that prematurely. And that's good. It's like, no, really think about, what does it really mean? Am I adopting this or principle, on principle or as a principle, or am I just seeing that, yeah, you know, a lot of times honesty makes sense. But that's not the same, you know, if that's the attitude or at a certain stage, yeah, I can see how it makes sense a lot of times, but not all the time. Good, keep thinking about it. You don't have the principle yet, but that's okay. I mean, you shouldn't have it before you have it, before you see it and you pursue these kinds of questions. Okay. Sorry, I'm like pursuing you. She's trying to go home. You know, she's trying to go away. And I'm like, I'm pursuing you now. Sorry about that. Harassment. Yes. Um, so I really liked your talk, and you. um, integrity is a is a virtue that I take very seriously uh, in myself, uh, and it's something that I look for in other people. Um, and I would say, to a certain degree, that I judge other people by um, my intuition for integrity. And um, so, um, m m the question that I had is, I I'm having trouble sort of integrating. I really like all the things that you're saying about integrity. Um, and I have a definition of integrity that I just want to put forward to you, and I'm sort of trying to integrate my conception of integrity with some of the ideas that you mentioned, which I very much agree with. Um, when I think of a person's integrity, like somebody who I've just met mm. or somebody who, who I know for a while, I sort of ask myself questions. And um, for example, like, is this a person who would keep a secret? Um, you know, like they wouldn't go, tell, tell, like, would, would they keep a secret? Would they pay up if they lost a bet? if it was like a $1 bet or a $10 bet or a $100 bet? Is this a person who would break a promise to win a board game or break a promise for $100 or break a promise for a million dollars? Or would they break a promise to protect themselves from going to prison or something? Like mm. if, I, if, I, if I was, you know, working with a journalist or something who in some extreme cases, you know, th if they disclose their identity, then they'll get off. But like, um, but they might, th they could be at risk. So, so, so that's... That, that's kind of, and, and the last element that I would say is that uh, you mentioned a little bit, and I think I'm, I agree with you on this point, but like, um, um, like I wouldn't consider a person who does cost-benefit analysis in a situation of upholding integrity as a person of integrity. Like, if somebody's well, okay, sort of thinking, me, like, how me, does this benefit me, like, at the, at the critical how moment How this benefits of, me right. is the primary question. How this really benefits yeah. me, me with a long-term vision, with conceptual human vi right. vision, not that cow vision or the parrot vision, right? right? It's all about what's going to be good for me, but not calculated in this short term, how's it going to make me feel now? Is it going to put a little bit more money in the bank account? Because my well-being is a lot more than the, the, the money in the bank account, mm -hmm. okay? So I'm not trying to yell at you, I just oh, get no, excited no, no, about no, these yeah, things. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, so let me just say a couple of things. I think that some of your examples are taken at too piecemeal a level. And one thing I'll say right off the bat is if I've just met somebody, I have no judgment of his integrity. I have no idea whether this is a person of integrity. I mean, I give people the benefit of the doubt. I don't assume that they're not. Okay. But, you know, you can't. Does somebody have integrity? Do they stick to their principles? I, you know, you meet somebody last night. Well, what are your principles? You know, and what have you done about them lately? I, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's like, where did you come in from? That's what I always say to people. Have you noticed that? She's always asking, well, where are you from? You know, you've got to start somewhere with people. Anyway, um, so 
Well, but certain people, it's, I mean, maybe I mean, I think that yeah. some of the examples that you raise can be indicators of, you know, if this guy is just not even going to pay his bets or some, you know. But they're all, some of them at least seem almost too, like they don't even rise to the level of, I mean, this guy is just, I mean, somebody who's not, you know, he makes a bet or he's going to cheat in a game of Monopoly or something, like, who the hell is this part? I mean, we're not even close to integrity there. I don't know if that makes some sense well, to you. Well, I mean, what about the more extreme examples? I'm sorry? Though? I mean, like, like, for example, I would say that a minority of human beings, um, perhaps this is a generalization, but I would say that there are not a lot of people who would, uh, keep, who would go to prison to keep a promise, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And, that, like, that's an extremely well, right. high that's But, an I extremely mean, why would they have to go to prison to keep like, the promise? I mean, there's a lot more you'd want to well, know. Well, yeah, there's, there's, context know if, there's contextual right. things like that. I mean, right. assuming that it was standing up for something right yeah. or... I mean, or, let, me, let me just say this, and then we'll go yeah. on to some other questions. I mean, I think there's something very good. There is, you know, having said, I think that some of your examples are at a little too... Again, piecemeal a level is the way I put it. But at the same time, it's very good to try to tease out. So if she's saying this is what integrity is, or if this is what Rand thinks integrity is, what would that imply for this kind of question, or that kind of question, or that kind of test? But I think there's a lot more to be thinking about in between those to really try to grasp what, you know, people the world over, they love integrity. I mean, whether they're altruists or ego, you know, uh, everybody seems to love integrity. What's so hot about it? What is it? Is it living by your principles, whatever your principles? You know, like, what is it? And then, what if any good is that? What reason is there to do that? I would think about that a little bit further first, and then, okay, so if somebody is living by his principles, what are some of the manifestations that we'll see of that? But it, it's hard to figure out another person's integrity. But first, just, you know, let's work on it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We have another online question. So, Stephen asks, if rational moral principles in some sense capture what living looks like for a healthy, rational animal, it seems that they should be easy and it should feel natural. Why is what is seen as normal by Rand also seen as in some sense rare and difficult? If he means rare and difficult um, in the non-objectivist world, it's because they're, they're trying to practice stuff they couldn't possibly practice consistently, right? I mean, I talked a little bit about this. It's like, if you're trying to practice and you're, you know, extolled for being consistent on an impractical code, a self-harmful code, you're not going to be able to do it. So it's like, yeah, it's rare to take your medicine to kill yourself, to be the martyr, and so on, right? Um, but another aspect of the question, or at least something that might be in it, I think, yes, ideally even for the objectivist, right, it becomes easy. It becomes second nature, right? I read that passage toward the very end. I think maybe even, I forget, but if it was in the conclusion, but toward the very end, it's, yeah, you, you don't want to have to struggle over your integrity all the time. You don't want to have to struggle over living your principles all the time. But we all know, even if we become pretty damn integrated, you know, and we're pretty good at the virtue of integrity and living all our principles, there are occasions on which, yeah, it's a little harder here. Or there, you're struggling for some reason. And... Again, the more you, you know, be conscious and end up, yeah, no, doing the right thing, the more you can make it second nature and easy for yourself. So, yeah. hi. Okay. So you talked a bit about how integrity depends on rational principles. I wonder if you have any thoughts on the use of integrity in uprooting error in principles, oh, because nothing good. really makes a bad principle's badness obvious as quickly as trying to put it into practice consistently. Uh, good, interesting question. Thank you. Um, the first thing that came into my mind is that introspection that I was talking about, right? Uh, and not just introspection, but I said, you know, the two thinking aspects, it's, it's a virtue primarily about acting on your principles. But I said, okay, but you got to think about your principles and you got to think about yourself. And I think this is part of why it's important to be on an ongoing basis thinking about your principles, as opposed to, hey, you know, been there, done that. Read the objectivist ethics, read Dr. Peikoff's further analyses, great, got them. Do I really have them? Do I, then why am I having this conflict here? 
and even if you're not having a particular conflict, I mean, I've gone back to the virtue of integrity and many virtues, and, and for, I mean, I wrote a whole damn chapter about integrity, I don't know how many years ago now, right? But then lately, there was just some stuff I thought, and I do think I now have a deeper understanding of integrity. I don't think I've got the whole thing. I bet in a few more years I could come up with some more aspects that would be newer to me at least and flesh out my understanding. So in part I want to say you just, you want to keep thinking about your principles and not just again in the lab or in your car at the red lights, but I mean see them in practice. Be on the lookout to identify, even in other people when you're reading the news, is that an example of justice? Is that an example of, in, of injustice or of uh, you know, refusal to be productive or whatever? Look for them in the world around us, our principles to identify, because sometimes we'll find, oh, I had been assuming such and such about what this principle requires, and you know, now that I've seen these two different things just in the last couple of months, it's making me think more deeply that maybe I don't have the, a, a fully proper understanding of, of this. Because, you know, we all know, you understand in stages, or you're, you're, you understand. I mean, let me give you an example. One of the first times Dr. I heard that example that Dr. Peikoff uses, which I think is comparable to some of the examples I use today, about, the, you know, okay, the $5 coupon is just $5, man. Um, and I, I didn't look this up, so I'm not going to remember it properly. But he's got an example where it's something like you're cutting out your eyes, you know, how, how the hell are you going to see the gallery if you're cutting out your, your own eyes, right? And it's somewhat comparable to the what do you get with, for $5 million if it's not objectivism, okay? But the first time I ever heard that, it was like, oh, that's interesting. To say I didn't get it, I have to be, like, I didn't get it. I got that, oh, that might be right, there might be something there. But it was this very dim, hazy, like, oh, there might be something there. Let me just say, it's gotten a lot clearer over the years. So you have to pay attention to all of your experience to be looking wherever you can for the evidence that will either reinforce your principles, but it's not like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm looking to do that rationalization, just reinforce what I got from, you know, or to say, I, I'm not sure about how this principle applies in this context, so maybe it's not a principle. Hi. Hi. Um, before, uh, before I ask my original question, there was a question that came earlier, and I just want to make a comment about that. Uh, keeping a secret is contextual. So if somebody tells me that they're going to wear a suicide vest into the middle of Times Square, I'm not keeping their secret. <laughs> so You have things to discuss. <laughs> um, you made an example uh, earlier about evasion, and you said that there's two people who have... Mm. Uh, who two friends who have friends this year, and I, it's quarrel, like, I've got to try to figure out. To right, and you have to decide what you feel about it, so you're deciding... You, Not uh, just what I feel, or, or, or what, you, what I feel is I want right. the friendships, right? right. But what I have to figure out what I think, if I think it's a sufficiently think? serious issue, right. and so on. I yeah. misspoke on that. I, right. uh, um, what do you think of it? And, um, and you could push it off, and that would be evading, not cho choosing not to make a decision. But if you could, you could also reserve judgment, which is to say I don't have enough information and I'm going to not make a decision until I have more yes. information. So um, how do you differentiate okay. those? Okay, and that's important. I mean, so a few things is a good, interesting question. Um, yeah, there is such a thing as reserving judgment. There is such a thing, and it's perfectly legitimate sometimes to do that or to say I don't yet know. But there's also, you know, and this is related to something else I was saying, there's, I don't know, I don't have enough information. Okay, but there are times when you ought to find, you ought to then go after more information. That doesn't mean you need to get it by tomorrow morning necessarily. And I mean, you have to, again, be honest with yourself or when are you ready to address an issue more fully? When have you gathered enough info, done enough thinking and so on to reach the conclusions? But here again, you need to be honest with yourself, but also honest about the significance of the issue, is it something I need to make a decision on, and why, okay? Mm -hmm. But again, and I didn't go into any sorts of, I mean, I didn't embellish the example very much, mm -hmm. but there are situations in which you know, I mean, there are some situations like, oh, this is pretty serious, and if, if what he's saying is right, or if what she's saying is right, then this, then I can't, I would not want to be friends with him or friends with her and so on. Okay, well then figure out what you're gonna do, you know, so again, 
But no, reserving, and that also relates to the virtue of justice that I right. was talking about. There Absolutely. are times when it is appropriate to suspend. There are also things it's like you couldn't possibly, like it's not for you to know, you don't need to know because it's a little bit more remote from mm -hmm. your life or it's a less, less of a value. Thank okay, you. thanks. We have another online question. Okay. Uh, this is from... It's funny, this is a little like being at, on a talk show or one of those, you know, like there's this voice, I don't know where he, are you here? <laughs> you are, who is this person? Everybody right points, and it's like they're pointing to the machine. Who's talking? I'm in the very back of the room. Hi. Hi. You're not Sam, are you? I am Sam. Oh, I'd love to talk to you later. Isn't that... You see? You, you say what's on your mind, and good values come. Hi, Sam. I do want to talk to you later. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, but now I'm going to relay Puya's question from online. He asks, could you please touch on the dual character of principles as both an end and a means? i.e. the issue that we don't choose principles for any particular consequence, uh, but for achievement of the life that embodies those very principles. That's a good and hard question um, that I punted on in the talk. Oh, it just, like, it is a... At a certain level of understanding objectivism, you need to understand that principles aren't I mean, they are practical. They are for purposes, okay? They're not inherently good or right or obli obligation-making. I mean, the only reason why moral principles or any sort of normative principles about what we should do, we should because we're after a certain end. But as fundamental principles for living your life, the ends that they're after are also abstract. That doesn't mean fake, right? But it means they're about a broad understanding of the kinds of life that you have. And part of, part of that life will be the life of a human being. And given that a human being can only be a human being and live if he respects his nature as a rational animal who's got to live by reason and got to live by principles, then it's having a life of principle will be part of the very end that is envisioned and sought such that it's, one shouldn't think of principles as on this kind of case-by-case -case basis, well, if I'm honest here, I'll get the job, or I'll get the girl, or whatever it might be. Principles are not like fortune cookies, or they're not crystal balls that'll tell you, well, you work by this principle, you'll get X. You know, you're going to meet a Latina, uh, you know, and she's just going to be lovely, and salsa, and everything. It's like, no, they don't give you that kind of particularistic forecast of what you will get out of them, but, but adherence to them, if they're valid and at the appropriate level of uh, fundamentality and generality and what they uh, reflect, will be the, the basic guides that anybody needs in order to succeed in life. Yeah, there's more I could say there, but yes. So I have a question about um, something that you brought up and touched on uh, related to when um, Reardon and Dagny are not making a, are not having a breach of morality in not recognizing that their efforts are actually serving their enemies. Um, that was not a breach in morality. But what if you do consider that your efforts and productivity are going to benefit a system that you don't agree with or that you find to be morally abhorrent. Um, it, it is related to the, is it time to shrug question? This, this last year has been very hard. There's been a lot of injustice in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, so well, I think it is a question, you know, you have to think about the fuller context of if my actions might be helping people I would not want to help, but what is it that's making your actions do that? Is it a fault in your actions? Is it the fault of conditions around you? Are those conditions that are changeable? Um, what would it take to change them or to make any difference as to whether those conditions would obtain, right? If, if you could be indifferent, like if conditions around you didn't hurt you, um, to hell with it, in, in a sense. You would, there wouldn't be reason to care about doing something to change those conditions or refusing your sanction. But, I mean, part of what we see in Atlas, right, is by giving the sanction, the good guys are hurting themselves, right? Enough, right? So they say, enough, not going to do this anymore. 
We don't have to do this. There are alternatives. We unfortunately don't, you know, as uh, Yaron said this morning, we don't live in Atlantis. Uh, so it would be more costly, I think, much more costly, among other things, to, uh, to just check out. Is that a breach? I'm sorry? Is that Is a breach? Why would it be a breach? Because it's a compromise of your values to say, I'm not going to... To I'm say that, wait, wait, wait a second. It's a compromise <laughs> of my values to say, hey, y'all aren't behaving. Y'all aren't behaving the way you're supposed to. How is that a compromise of my values? That's not. But to, to continue, I guess, to continue your efforts n knowing or believing that it's going to harm you in some way by Right, but you're not, it's not other. like you have good alternative. I mean, the kind of situation we're very broadly and quickly mm -hmm. sketching here, right? It doesn't sound like you have alternatives. Mm -hmm. So it's not, I mean, you've got to figure out what are the values to live by? What are the principles to live by for a human being? And to the extent that, yeah, you can still live by those in this society, you live by those. You try to educate people, change some people's minds about what the right principles to live by are, but you're not selling out on, I mean, it's, it's a little bit like the case with the Nazi at the door and so on. You're not selling out on your principles if you act as if this principle should be applicable, context-free, context-regardless. No, principles only make sense in a certain... Con I mean, it's the emergency, it's the lifeboat situation again. Um, you know, and Rand talks about that in some essays. It doesn't apply... It's not an end in its... It's not an, in an end in itself or, you know, doing this kind... Taking this kind of action. So Thank you. I understand about context there. One, one more question. Um, so, in her books, Ayn Rand says that Love is exception making. So how does that apply to integrity? And is that what she means? Oh. I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, that, uh, you know. No, even Dagny talks about it when she's. I really don't know what to say to that. Um, and I don't mean that in any way as a problem. <laughs> I hate to say this, but. I forget where she says it. But um, tell you the truth, I'm not sure. Uh, I've always been a little bit puzzled by that. Yeah. And you're making me realize that I've not thought about it as much as I should. Um, so thank you for embarrassing me. Uh, <laughs> but with great poise, don't you think? Um, anyway. But uh, let me just say this, right? I mean, her view of love, romantic love, and even, you know, love for certain friends, right? It's, you're responding to the values you see in them, right? To, I mean, this is her basic view of love. I don't know how much you've read about her views here, but you're responding to things that you respect about that person. Her view is not, so you cert one certainly wouldn't want to take that line out of context. Of, ah, you make exceptions for the people you like, or the people who, you know, they're hot or something like it's like no it's not exception making in that way they are of exceptional va I mean, the ones you love the most they are of exceptional value to you but ah, I'm sorry you've really embarrassed me <laughs> um, I think she said it like when Dagny was talking about how she wants to be broken by oh I think mm -hmm. that that might or line into Dominique. Oh, okay if Dominique I, I, oh okay. I don't know that, that, that I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to be much more help. Okay, Sorry. thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.